should have thought of an ending. I didn't, because I didn't go down on the given. Like I was given, like there's more. What? That gift. And I'm just thinking of this on my own right now. <laughs> that gift really rocks. <laughs> I just thought of that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, Karen uh, Kilgariff, my head writer, has mentioned something else in my ear, but when she was telling me something, I thought to myself, what a funny joke that would be to say that. Yeah. And I now forgot what you had said to me. <laughs> something different than what I said on my own that I thought of. What had you said to me? I had been gossiping about the other writers. That's right. <laughs> and it was something about the new writer, Jason. What yes, was it? It was gossip about him and his parents. <laughs> That's what she does sometimes during meetings, to lean over and whisper about gossip. <laughs>
Angry people now total 99.9% uh, of, of the nation's population. No joke for that. Good night. Um, okay, and uh, let's see. Word blending. I'm doing some word blending. I love word blending. I love that we have, we have bromance. We have showmance. And then for people who develop a crush on their debt relief counselor, we have omance. How are you? Um, anybody get hurt in the way down? All righty. Very good, very good. Uh, I guess I want to, I, I should explain something to you, and that is that I have been trying to bolster my energy with power nutrition shakes, and I did one this morning that had so much bee pollen in it that I actually have been buzzing all day. My head is buzzing. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. Uh, but we are available on iTunes, um, and that's important. Um, let's see. No, I, so my energy is a little, little crazy. I don't know if you're nutritionally, uh, you know, comedians generally not nutritional uh, experts. Uh, usually there's some kind of a deficiency that leads to being in comedy in the first place. Um, I think I can attest to that. Uh, let's see. I have so many things. You know, I don't know if you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of great uh, tours happening this summer, com comedy tours. And one of my favorites is the uh, Carlos Mencia Life Lock Steal Your Material Identity Theft Tour. Uh, and then, of course, the Hezbollah Ha Ha Hype Energy Drink Comedy Explosion. <laughs> That's one of my personal favorites. Um, there, it has to be a, a brand and entertainment thing. This is the big thing now. Uh, and there's a new uh, term also called brand jutainment, which I think has to do with brands and Jews, uh, of which I am both. Let's see. Uh, what do I want to tell you? Well, you know, the other thing is that um, I was uh, in, uh, looking through storage for, through some old pictures, and I found a great one, um, and it was of me uh, during my bar mitzvah, which was a, a key moment in my, in my life. Um, in the painting, I have, uh, in the picture, I happen to have the hair of Dear Abby. My hair is actually going up in a 50-foot buck and wing butter doodle beehive. It's way up. And I sort of look like Pippi Longstocking on Prozac. And as I looked at the picture, the picture actually looked back at me and said, you're 49, you're not a man and your life is over. And then the eyes went around the picture. Um, so um, that's uh, a little bit about my, my, photo, my photo collection. Um, and I should tell you that growing up in my house, storytelling was king. Storytelling was very important. Um, my family sort of came to life when they told stories. And, and my family, my, my parents were very good at it. And they used to, they would read me nursery rhymes, I, one of my first memories. But they would inject their own personal marital problems, and I'll wait, right into the rhyme, right? So three years old and you're hearing, um, Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. Along came your father, who was no help as usual. <laughs> and you have that in your house. And then you have Jack and Jill went up the hill. I wish I had the strength to go up a hill, but your mother mentally drains me. <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, that's what you have. Um, and I, uh, my, my daughter loves stories too. I guess she, she gets that from that, that part of the family. And um, uh, she's always telling me, she says, Daddy, you know, tell me this one, tell me that one. Tell me that great story about when Grandma heard all those voices. And, um, you know, it's interesting. <sighs> Good to have you with us. Um, also, I wanted to tell you that, uh, uh, let's see, uh, yes, my grandmother, that was great. My grandmother growing up, I used to watch TV with her, and, and if she were alive today and she was watching the United States of Tara, there'd be like 800 people in that room. Uh, no question about it. I'm glad that I took a pause and then went back to the schizophrenia jokes. Um, Okay, let's see. What else do I want to tell you? It's, no, I think we're. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna start the show tonight's show. By the way, this is not. We have a new sponsor tonight, and uh, it's Moodament, and it's the first antidepressant mouthwash. Moodament, just because you have low uh, energy uh, and your mood elevator is not going all the way to the top, why should you suffer from from, from bad breath? So <laughs> Moodament. Uh, is now available in new uh, spearmint, peppermint, and new root and toot and well uh, That's Moodamint. All right. Without any further ado, we're very lucky once again to be joined by uh, our comedy news reporter, uh, comedy news specialist, 
Julie Mitchell. Julie, welcome to the show again. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. It's nice to be here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you, as always. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot going on in the comedy world. I know there's a lot you want to get to. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. So, whatever you want to do, take it away. Okay. Well, I'm sure all of you are anxiously awaiting the results of my stand-up last week. <laughs> but it got canceled because of plumbing issues. So, isn't that the way it always is? I try to do something for myself and crap just gets in the way of it. So I don't want to be funny anymore, Ed. You've decided to stop it? I'm going to stop being funny and just be a writer instead. That's the plan. So I really brainstormed a lot of stuff tonight. I hope um, people who hire writers are watching because I, I think they'll be impressed. <laughs> but first, before we get to all that, people that are still trying to be funny, at the club, we have Chris Hardwick. He's at the Cap City Comedy Club in Austin, if it doesn't get canceled. And at the Laughing Skull Lounge in Atlanta, Georgia, which does not sound like a funny name for a club, there's Mark Marin, and then there's Gary Goldman and Josh Gondelman. Do you know them, Ed? I don't know them, but they sound, they couldn't sound more Jewish if they were actually, gone, if they were riding in a Gondelman. Oh. I don't even know what that means. Do you? I would think that was Italy, right? I think he's Italian because gondolas are Italian. But that's just me. So, okay, here comes the good part. Spike TV is developing this new show. It's called Alternative History. And it's about like, hey, what if Hitler won World War II? What if JFK was never killed? <laughs> but I have some better ideas for them. And they're more relatable. What if Molly Ringwald was still famous? <laughs> Everything would be like 16 Candles, right? That's my favorite movie. Or what if the earth was still flat? Or if, uh, if Mel Gibson liked people? Or uh, what if I didn't go to Vegas last weekend? How much better would my life be right now? <laughs> uh, what if aliens did not exist? That would be pretty cool. Uh, what if alcohol was good for you and vegetables weren't? That'd be quite a twist, I think. <laughs> what if we didn't have the internet, Ed? How would we read books or research things? So those are my ideas for alternative history. That is fantastic. And I'll tell you what, you, uh, I think you can do both. I think you can be a writer and I think you can be a stand-up. I can't, but I think you can. Really? Yeah, I really do. All right. So I would say you're going to go back, you're going to go back to the club. You're not going to give it up. Um, I don't know. It got rescheduled, but we'll see. Okay. The plumbing is good now? I don't know. That's the point. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens, Ed. And we will see what happens, and we're going to work on the plumbing all week long. Julie Mitchell, everybody in the universe. Julie Mitchell, oh. so talented. Thank and you. you can't stop being funny. Oh, thanks, Ed. <laughs> I, however, can. I'm the Hebrew hammer of shame. All right. You know what I'd like to do right now? I would like to actually play a clip of one of my favorite comics, a very good friend, and someone who happened to be a judge on Last Comic Standing this year. Would you please, uh, Kenny, pull up the clip of a uh, good friend, Mr. Andy Kindler, uh, performing stand-up on Last Comic Standing. I want you all to know that I will be judging myself internally during my performance. Before I was a judge on Last Comic Standing, I was against contest, but this show has turned me around. Now I think all of our profession should be judged on the basis of a contest. How about Last Scientist Standing? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Tonight, one scientist will move forward. One scientist will be eliminated. That's a great theory, Einstein, but you've been voted out of the laboratory. Tonight, America, you will decide if string theory is valid. Or perhaps the multiverse theory is more up your alley. Remember, you can vote up to ten times for each theory. Here's a, here's a little known historical fact. The great artist Monet, before he would start a painting, he would yell out to no one in particular, Do you people like Impressionism? Half the crowd was stunned by that joke. I may not be the last comic standing, but I'm the first comic on stage to admit when a joke doesn't go over. I like to comment a lot about my act during my act. Uh, before I was a comedian, I was in the deconstruction business. I never built anything, I just commented while other people built. D drywall looks more like wet wall. 
Don't encourage me. I, uh, th I was watching, there was a documentary on the, uh, on the, the, on the history, on the, on the, on the History Channel. I like to fun for it, it's my style. Documentary on the History Channel about uh, Hitler and his drug problems called High Hitler. <laughs> not, not Heil Hitler, High Hitler. It's cutesy. Is this what it's come to? We need a gimmick now to get people to watch Hitler? Are you telling me that Hitler's numbers are down? Uh, that's my new thing. Whenever I travel, kind of point, whenever I travel, I check at a hotel, I turn on the TV, they always advertise on demand. On demand. You don't have to wait 10 minutes to see your favorite Hollywood movie. Watch it right now on demand. Then you see the choices. Duplicity. It's complicated. Again, Nicolas Cage tries an action movie for. This does not fulfill the promise of on demand. You will never hear me yell out from my hotel room, I demand to see old dogs now. <laughs> yes, I'll take it. Front desk, front desk, hold my calls. I'm watching the proposal. <laughs> this actually happened a couple of months ago. My manager emailed me. They just had an inquiry from VH1 Celebrity Fit Club. That's not nice, right? So I email him back, I say, are they implying that I'm out of shape? And he shoots back, why don't you look at the bright side? They're implying you're a celebrity. I enjoy applause, I do enjoy it. I'll take it, I will take it. There's so many reality shows on TV, I don't even know what they mean. There's a show called Wife Swap which if it was about swapping, I'd give it a shot. <laughs> but no, on Wife Swap, what happens is that two families agree to switch wives. Uh, I just sold my own show. It's called Family Medication Swap. <laughs> two seriously ill families agree to switch medication. How will a diabetic react to cholesterol-lowering drugs? How will someone with severe hypertension react to antidepressants? Uh, I'm having a stroke, but you know what? I'm okay with that. It's cool because of the... <laughs> How about Andy Kindler, everybody? The greatest uh, Jew alive. <laughs> Fantastic. Andy, we love you and we miss you. Um, I'm Ed Krasnick. You're watching This Week in Comedy. I want you to remember, and I want you to, uh, to do this, we have a contest trying to find out what is the best Marvin Hamlish scored film. Uh, and Marvin Hamlish was a genius, you know, uh, and I want to find out what your favorites are. And if, you, if we agree, next week I'm going to give away a gift, and this is the gift. The Mystery Science Theater 3000 box set, valued at over $40 billion. That's right, this is very expensive. So, pound, D-W-I, T-W-I-C-O-M, pound, T-W-I-C-O-M, tweet it in, your favorite Marvin Hamlish scored film. And don't give me chorus line, because I'm not going to pick it. All right. <laughs> All right, now with us, now joining us, very fortunate, on my left, your right, screen right, uh, whatever, would be a uh, very good friend, great singer, great writer, great comedian. Uh, we're going to talk to her about Last Comic Standing. We're going to find her purse before the afternoon is over. <laughs> Please welcome Karen Kilgariff. Karen. <clears throat> Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you so much. It's just nice to sit at a table with you two. Um, and also, along with Karen, uh, a gentleman who is writing on a great show, uh, the, the IT Crowd and uh, has some hysterical uh, videos which we're going to show you, uh, parodies of Mad Men, uh, Talented Man, and a, and a new one-man show which we're going to talk about. Rob Delaney is here. Rob. Hello, Ed. Pleasure to see you. And hello, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know where to go from that. I think the way, the first thing is I got, I got to ask you, you know, last comic standing, uh, you come in, you're working on that show, is that, is it, is it, was it a good experience? Was it a fun experience? Was it a high pressure experience? Uh, what kind of, what kind of time did you have over there? It was great. Um, it was no pressure for me because I just came in at the, the last five weeks. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, it was fun and easy. And Paige Hurwitz, who is one of the executive producers, is a friend of mine um, and a hilarious comedian herself. So she brought me in and Hugh Moore, I don't know if you know Hugh Moore. He's a hilarious stand-up comic and writer, and he was already there. The two of them were writing the whole show for the, the previous part of the season, so then I just came in to kind of boost it up. Pretty cool. Um, 
feel like I'm speaking at, like very reverently and and humbly <laughs> about it, but I don't. There's not that much to. Not that much to talk about. No, I mean it was great, and I, you know, it was really fun, and I, um, it was fun to write for something and not feel like every single thing was my honor and reputation. You know, was was. Um, Waiting. <laughs> it was riding on it. Yeah, exactly. You didn't have that kind of, and usually, usually there is a lot of pressure. I mean, when you were writing for Ellen, that's a different kind of. I felt a lot of pressure at that show. Yeah. You're the head writer, and. Yeah, and I just felt. Yeah, there was lots of uh, there was dr lots of self uh, self inflicted drama, kind of. So <laughs> it's really nice to just breeze in and kind of be like, "Is this my desk? I'll never hang a picture. Never, you know. All right, see you later." Like uh, being a hired gun is it's. More exciting, it's much sexier, and it's easier on the, you know, the emotional toll. Listen, I have got to find out what that's about. Uh, all of those things that you mentioned, I've never heard of them. I don't know what they are. <laughs> I don't know, sexier I've never heard of, and I don't know what less pressure would mean. Uh, although this show is a lot of fun to do. Uh, now you, we, did you, what do you guys think of comedy competitions? I mean, just, just comedy competitions in general. Have you ever done one as a performer? Have you ever done one as a performer? Yeah, I had wanted to ask you, was there still a specter sort of <laughs> behind the scenes <laughs> from my having been uh, booted off the show, you yeah. know, kind of really towards the beginning, sort of like on the first episode. How did that color the, your work environment? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would just say on a on a daily basis, mm -hmm. there would um, if somebody spilled coffee or uh -huh. forgot to do something, like they you, they delayed. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I mean that's just that's how it is when you put yourself <laughs> on the line. Mm -hmm. It's part of exposing yourself, mm -hmm. and it's you know there's a lot of glory, but yep. there's a lot of shame. Yep. And um, I'm glad you asked about that. Me too. Yeah. You do you do the you do Delaney you yeah. Delaney yeah. yourself you Delaney it and right. not Dana no no no, no. nor Kim nor Kim no. maybe Kim. Else? Uh, Kim no I can't it. think of any other famous Delaney that's pretty much it mm -hmm. you uh, you know what the the thing about you guys that you have in common is that you're both winters no you're both um, <laughs> you're both sing you both sing yeah you sing both sing really well mm -hmm. you uh, were actually in musical theater that is correct yeah quite a bit mm -hmm. well there's no need to shout. Um, no, you were you were in musical theater. So what 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 were you doing, and how did the, how how did you make the transition over from musical theater? I graduated from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts in 1999, and from before I graduated, I got the job as Sir Lancelot in the national tour of Camelot. Aww. Believe it or not, so I did that for a year, and then I did uh, some other shows in New York, and then I started to do TV and stuff. But then I just I what TV? Uh, oh, all my children. Oh, uh, I didn't was, want to mention it. Uh, <laughs> what happened? You're holding what, back. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think more. Those were wonderful times, and I'm glad they all happened. But I haven't thought about any of them in a while, so I'm trying to dig back there. And did you play a doctor? Or like no, I didn't. I played. Uh, I was a security guard in the hospital, so I would wrestle with people. I would save and find people, missing people. <laughs> I would run up and down staircases and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I got to wrestle with the now incandescently famous Josh Duhamel, I believe you say? Yes. That's how you say his name? I yes. got to wrestle with him. That's actually uh, somewhat anecdote worthy. I thought, I'm 6'3", <laughs> I weigh well over 200 pounds, and I got my first script, and it had me wrestling with him, and I thought, hey, he's just a little soap guy, you know, I'll, that'll be no Take problem. Him down. And then I got there, and he's uh, the same size or larger than me, and considerably more fit, and uh, wrestling with him was scary, uh, <laughs> and I didn't enjoy it at all, and it took all my strength to not get hurt, and I hope I don't have to ever do it again, because uh, he's uh, a lot stronger. And was part of that his beauty that it was so hard to it, be that close? It was disarming. Yeah. It was a disarming beauty that he yeah. has. He's striking. He He's truly striking. is. And I'm ostensibly heterosexual, but when you get close to something, when you get that close to something of that beauty, it's just the way you identified <laughs> yeah. previously, you hit pause. It's on not that. about, well, yeah, it yeah. becomes not about those labels. Yeah. It's just you want a piece of it. It's like yeah. the hypnosis I was watching Curious George with my daughter, and the mm -hmm. snake will hypnotize you. Yeah. And that's what it's like. You see colors and yeah. not people. Totally. Yeah, that's right. Same thing. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting experience. Well, 
and 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 is the pressure of being in a soap does it does it rival the pressure of being a stand-up comic in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I I mean I was on that show for a few episodes, oh, yeah, and I've so. done this so much more stand-up. So I would say it was pretty cool. I think soap operas are very cool. I don't watch them, but it is fun to do them because you're doing five-hour-long episodes a week. You know, so the work ethic has got to be amazing. So. It's a pretty cool job. Uh, I don't know about viewing experience, but <laughs> they're fun cool. to do. Yeah, cool. And they're a good cool. workout and good training to do anything, sure. even surgery. You, did you go, have you tried any surgery? Uh, nothing more than like a, you know, trache a surprise tracheotomy and like a drunk friend. Surprise know? one? Yeah. They're the funniest ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it's it's the yeah. element of surprise. Totally. What? Acts as an anesthesia, and then you're like, you nut job, oh. they'll say. Well, anything to save a life, mm -hmm. I always say, especially when it's your own. Look mm -hmm. at that over there. Um, so, so, Karen, now, you have been, now, I saw this great clip of you singing at the Fake Gallery. You do a lot of, a lot of interesting work at the Fake Gallery. Yeah, that's where I do my most interesting work. I, I love the fake. Color. I save it for there. <laughs> and, and, uh, and and when you write, you do you write song? Are songs something that you write like on? I mean, do you sit and, and write stuff all the time, or is it just like once in a while the the spirit moves? Because I asked you to write a song for a show one time, and it's like an anthem of mine. I, I have never forgotten the lyrics. I actually showed it to a friend the other day. That clip. <laughs> Well, it's thank you. It's amazing. I well, but I, mean, I just asked you, and in one like an hour, you like sat down and wrote this like anthem. Um, because well, I think that that made sense. It was like, um, it's a self-help show. Can you write a song for it? Was kind of the idea, and then I was like, I know a lot. Of, I have a lot of books, and I've spent a lot of time in the Barnes and Noble self-help section. So I can really, I think I can lay down some some tracks for this. And it actually just was like. It was kind of like the exercise of what's at, can I actually say the truth? Like, what would the most true statement be, one right after the other? And it was just a series of like, um, you know, statements so true that you could never really say them, and they're all in a song. I love that song. That's a great song. Thank and you. and and you and I've seen you do things. You know, what I admire about you is that you're. And I'm starting to go into James Lipton territory, so I got to pull myself. Let's back. go there. I'm starting to pull. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you take your time on stage in a way that I was never able to do it. Like when you go on a stage, I've watched you a bunch of times, you're like, you're not rushing. You don't like answer the fear bell or you don't outwardly do it. You don't speed up. You know what bell I answer? The rage bell. So <laughs> I get really, I hate the audience so much. I can't even explain how much I hate the audience. I really, um, it's taken me a really long time to understand that, that it's about me and the audience having fun together and not about me crushing their will into the ground. Because, of course, you never win that battle and, and you know, it's a, set, it's a sad setup to begin with. And that's how I've always done comedy until very, very recently. It's been like, it's, I will kill you with my humor. <laughs> and not, you took, not fun. And you turned it around. Everyone loses. So yeah, I kind of had that epiphany of like, what if whatever the audience was doing didn't impact me, God forbid, and I just did my thing and kind of moved on. <laughs> Actually, Paul Provenza was talking about that at that one show of how the audience cannot have that hold on you. Yes, that's right. And I, that was, I had just been coming to that kind of awareness of like, I need to have fun and it can't be, it can't be predicated on like what the look on this guy's face is over here because I can find those people in the crowd Immediate, I mean, there can be like 50 people like, yay, and I will only find the one guy that's like sitting there with a puss on his face. And mm -hmm. I, it's just, and what they, I do. And they make that noise, they go, shh, oh. which you don't like. You I don't really like, don't like that noise. It's not a laugh, it's sort of a... It's like, I'll give you this sound that sounds like the bus door is opening. And that's, <laughs> you know what? I don't want that sound. You save it for... That's the rage bell the goes bus. off. <laughs> and then ding, ding, ding. Yeah. yeah. And it's time to get on and off the bus. Mm -hmm. But quick. Do you, do you have that <laughs> same experience? Do you have, when you're on stage, are you, what's your, what's your relationship to the audience? I, uh, I mean, I love doing stand-up, so I try to, and my best sets are when I go out there well-prepared and respectful of the gift that these people have given me, which is sitting in a chair watching me perform, you know what I mean? So I try to be, to, to have my, what I do, even if it's filth, I try to have it be <laughs> sort of, 
acknowledging that they're doing me a wonderful mitzvah, to use one of your people's words, <laughs> to, to, you know, to Excuse really... me while I put my yarmulke on. <laughs> <laughs> I need a I mean? wig <laughs> and a long corduroy skirt. <laughs> like, there is, like what you were just saying, there has to be a joy in it. I have to enjoy myself, not at their expense, but I have to enjoy myself so that they relax enough to enjoy themselves, you know, because you are the captain of the ship, so to speak, and they're on it, and what they think and feel is important, you know, so you have to, like, lead them into funville, you know, by okay, now you've your got attitude. Some, <clears throat> but now you've got somebody in the audience who's talking right, or yelling yes. or opening up a uh, volume-treated sour ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got something going on in there. Now, what does that do? What, what happens do I do? Now? I don't like that, but you have to... <laughs> you don't like those yeah, things? Yeah, no, I don't like that. But you, what I will try to do at first, and I don't know if you... Know, I, I'm actually nervous to say these things, but some of the tricks of the trade or whatever is, first of all, you can make that not affect you through sheer experience and technique. You can be like, I noticed this thing as I'm telling my joke that I hate and want to murder, but I'm going to not show that, and I'm going to... So things that, t things that I'll try at first are to talk much louder. I mean, I always try to do stand-up very loud. I put the mic <laughs> almost in my mouth. So I try to drown them out, you know? So I'll try... For, this is... And I do mean this. I mean, I'll try to use, like, Jedi mind tricks where I'll just try to hate them, you know, into silence with volume and... And, but yet killing them with kindness. Like, if somebody's talking during my set, I want them to die in pain, but I'm not gonna show <laughs> that, because then they win. Then a really good approach is, if you must acknowledge them, is to genuinely appeal to them and act like it's really hurt you, and be like, I don't, why, why, you know, I'm just trying to tell some jokes for everybody. If you didn't do that, everybody else would have a lot more fun. Now, I'm not really hurt, but if I act like that, then the audience, will hate them and maybe even <laughs> physically murder them. So, you know what I mean? Like, if I can have the audience feeling bad for me, oh. So did they teach this at NYU? Because no, I never learned any of these that. things at all in San Francisco. Um, I, know, I don't know. I mean, that's just stuff I've sort of picked up, I guess, along the way. You know? Yeah, I didn't so. learn that at the, uh, at the uh, Charlie Horse in Kingston, Mass., which is a <laughs> club that is like the worst club yeah. in America. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But yeah. it is the worst club. It, it got that reputation. The, the owner of the club would book you by saying, mm -hmm. um, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but we have an opening tonight. Uh. Um, honest <laughs> to God. It was, like, it was like you went in there and all of a sudden you were in like the movie Chained Heat. It was Chained <laughs> Heat, but there were women and men mm -hmm. and they were having, people were shooting guns <laughs> and it's 20 miles outside of Boston. Nice. It's like Mississippi out there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> anyway, that was the, that was. Weird. Did you guys have? Have you had like really bad uh, road like clubs? Do, let me ask you this: Do you know what a no-win situation is when you walk into an engagement? Are you able to spot it and say, "Okay, nothing I do is going to work here in this night"? You know what it is. Well, I feel that way all the time, anyway. But I was doing. Uh, I had to do a one-nighter. Um, because I was I was middling for Patton Oswalt at the Comedy Underground in Seattle, in Seattle, yeah, which is an awesome club. Yeah. But part of that is if you're the middler um, during the week, then you have to go headline at um, it's basically like a hotel bar in Moscow, Idaho. Have you done that one? I did that one. And um, they the guy I went, drove out with, a lovely man. He's easily in his 60s, and he he did like knock knock jokes and kind of like, hey, you get off my get out my cloud, that kind of, um, the word play, uh, <laughs> Rolling Stone lyric joke where I was standing there like, like sweating cold sweats. So I was like, this is, and before he went on, they turned Seinfeld off the big screen, uh, which they, the people in the bar, of course, booed. Then this guy starts with his knock knock jokes and whatnot. And then I get up there with my Hey, uh, you know, who, who knows what I was trying to say, but and who cares? And uh, about ten, and I'm doing my set like I I had probably maybe a 25 minute set. I did it in seven minutes sure. easily, sure you did. and I had nothing. And uh, someone came and just put a shot right on the stool, like slammed it down. And I said, I don't drink. And they were like, boo, drink it. Like they wanted me to drink anyway. And then I went, you know what, you guys, this has been great. And I walked off the stage, literally, I think it was like 10 minutes in. And as I walked out, I had to go to my room, which was just down the hall from this bar. Um, 
as I walked out the door, there was a guy kind of just standing in the doorway, just silently, and as I passed him, he goes, boo. <laughs> like right, right into my ear. He uh, delivered it, it my my own right into your personal like, boo. And, and I, followed yeah. you. And followed you. Uh, with it. And I was like, "You're right. I mean, yes, boo it. It was awful. But, but yeah, it was there. It wasn't going to be any different for there me. There was nothing that you could have done that would have. And by the way, I worked in that same room. And when I was there, the KKK was there. No, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, no. There were two members of the KKK, and they started shouting like really uncomfortable Jew things. And I left the stage, and the guy I was working with was from the area, and he was a guy who was a prop act, and he was a very nice guy, and one of the things that he does in his, his act is he goes and he puts, he straps moose antlers on his head. And as I walked away from the stage, like in fear, he's strapping in the moose antlers, and he looks at me and he says, I'll see you in 45 minutes. <laughs> and he goes up on stage and he says, how many people think I have a little too much moose in my hair? <gasps> that was the beginning, <laughs> and, and that got yes. the crowd yeah. four hundred pairs of shoes That's in the right. air. Yeah. So it was. Uh, so I know. I mean, I we all had. Have. have you ever been fired in the middle of a uh, not in the middle of a show, but if you're doing a week or something? Have you ever been fired from any stand-up job? Not yet. <laughs> but I have a good one. I have a good one. It's kind of fun. That's happening right now. Yeah. So uh, a good size club. Uh, contacted me and said, hey, we, you're thinking of having you uh, come to our club. Can you send us some clips? So I did. And this is like a big club that I want to perform at. And uh, the, then they wrote back and they were like, you know, I think we're going to pass. Then whoever runs their Twitter account, which has like a pretty big following, regularly like retweets me and like promoting his So they have some mixed wires there or whatever where some of the people think that I'm funny and some of them don't. But they were like, Literally, somebody wrote me was like, "What about these weekends?" And then they were like, "We, our owner saw the tapes and no." So <laughs> I and I love that. Oh my god! I mean, I love that because I have a full slate of shows coming up. So that I get, I get high off that when stuff like that happens. <laughs> the owner saw the tapes and no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now this used to be, this is not the way it is, I don't think it's the way it is anymore, but years ago they used to have, uh, <clears throat> you know, there was like a, 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 a 10 minute uh, window when you could call in to get a spot. And you, this was in the days where there were no, I mean you had to call and you had to call mm -hmm. and that was it. And if you missed the, if they were like, nope, the five minutes is up, you didn't perform that week. So that was it. Um, so I can remember having the phone and doing that, and you had to dial it every time. It was like a bad like Hitchcock movie. It was like a black <laughs> phone with a rotary, and you had boo boo, boo and, you, and and you know everybody's face is close to yours, and it was I, I don't know. Anyway, it was a weird. There was that, and then there was uh, the improv. Used to have like twenty five clubs, which was about forty weeks of work. So if you got this one, and the woman who booked it would call you like one Tuesday in the fall. And if you missed that phone call, you missed 40 weeks of work. Ooh. That was like a whole thing. And this was before cell phones and... This is no cell phones, yeah. there's no, this is before dirt. <laughs> and it's before air, and what? it's also before people. <laughs> um, but comedy was still around. Comedy was around, there were no people. Uh, and still, they were, they were rejecting you. <laughs> um, the, the trees would lean, and they would go like that. They would go, ah, I don't know. Um, um, so, uh, <laughs> they found that fun. They like it. I don't know. It's physical. Well, you know what broke me in San Francisco? I don't know if you've done this. In San Francisco, they, that's my, I'm getting back. Is that your phone? Uh-huh. Um, sorry about that. I didn't turn it off. Every time a bell goes off, a comic gets its wings. I don't know. Um, in San Francisco, you used to have to go to the showcase night. It was, I think, on Mondays or Tuesdays. And you used to have to sit at the bar. So there'd be like 30 hopeful young comics who wanted to showcase that night. And then the manager, remember, he would just walk back and forth. And then he would be like, uh, you, you'll go on tonight. Wow. And you'd have to just sit there waiting to find out if you're going to do it. And that broke me. I was like, I did that maybe once or twice. And then I was like, I'm not doing this. Any like, I'm not going to sit here and wait to get picked. People are like, what are you talking about? And I just moved to LA. See, it's so much easier. It's just so much easier. Just get away from there. You don't need that crap. I mean, that, <laughs> but, but that's the thing. We, we all thought, you know, everybody wanted to please. And, and no one ever, you know, they never taught you that like you're the show, not the, the venue is not the show. 
The club is not the show. You are the show. You can move to another place. You can actually put your own thing up. You can do it in a living room. You can do it with a... This is what they don't... You had to get in with these places. Yeah. This was the important... And then the people who booked the clubs, this was a very interesting dynamic. They were your friends, but they weren't your friends, <laughs> which now carries over to L.A., which is now, it's not the club owners, now it's the people who do the networks and the development, and it's like you, you're friendly, but it's not, they're not, we're not friends. I mean, but, but it's sort of, you know, it's a strange kind of, I don't know any other business where it's sort of like, you know, hey, how the are you? Posturing and yeah, the, how you doing? doing? This is great. It's like that in insurance. Actually, <laughs> it, it really insurance? is. I, yeah, it's such a bummer. <laughs> but the payoff in insurance is so much better. Yeah, love <laughs> You could be part of the million dollar round table. <laughs> Why are we yelling? No. Uh, well, now, Rob, mm -hmm. I got to ask you. You're you're uh, you're going to do a solo show. Correct. Yeah. Have right you, now? Uh, no, on Tuesday. Oh. On Tuesday night. Hours. Have you have you ever done like a so, like a chunk a solo piece? She like, hasn't. I've seen it. He opened for me when I did my solo show in the little room at Largo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was it's, excellent. It's quite sloppy. I brought my father. He loved it. Did he? Yeah, he really did. Oh, I wish you had told me that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's it was so cool. long ago. It was probably two years ago or something. Almost. Yeah. A while what, ago. What was the experience? What, what kind of an experience did you have? Did you like that? Form? I'll do this quickly, and then you can talk about yours. <laughs> it was um, basically uh, Flanagan was opening the new Largo at the Coronet, right. so they had the big room with like 350 seats, and then there was the little room with like 60 seats that looked like a tiny version of the old Largo, which was kind of hilarious and weird. And so <clears throat> he wanted to just start booking kind of monthly shows there, and he was just trying to figure out. And he asked me to do a show there, and I, th he. You know, he meant, do you want to get like six comics and then you'll all do comedy in there? But of course, I thought he meant, why don't you finally write that show you've always been dreaming of? <laughs> is how I took it. <laughs> so, me and my friend Don Cummings, who's a brilliant musician and a uh, funny person, got together and started writing kind of sarcastic musical theater songs. Um, as if it were, as if I was writing my own one woman musical is kind of was the idea, but we did it without we did the songs first without really knowing what the show was going to be. So it was very um, nothing actually fit or made sense. And then in the middle, I showed a video of myself on America's Funniest People. Um, <laughs> so it was all just kind of like, hey, everybody, pay attention to me. Oh. Hurry, hurry, pay attention. To did me. you have Did you have a good time doing it, or was it? I had a great time actually. It was kind of. Um, uh, you know, singing for me is actually really, really hard. It, it's very intimidating to me. It's something I love to do, but I, but I, I want to be perfect at it, and I'm really, really not. So that is problematic for me and makes it um, difficult. Uh, well, I think even more important than what Karen thinks about it is what uh -huh. I think, having seen the show, sure, not sure. you know, being able to be objective about it. And in addition to being very funny, which of course it was, because Karen can't not be funny. Uh -huh. The music was. Very beautiful and heartwarming, and uh, you know, I even remember like I put on my coat and I put on my coat. I mean, like I remember it was very, uh, it was quite, uh, yeah. We, I loved it, and my father and I sang it to each other uh, in our bunks. In your bunks, yeah. It's so nice that a father and son can have bunk. Beds. They bunk together. Mm -hmm. You bunk. We're in a bunk, Dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What now? Now you. Uh, first of all, the name of the show, the mm -hmm. name of the solo show, is Naked and Bloody. Correct. What was the name of yours? Also naked and bloody. Also naked and bloody, like Rob Delaney. Um, <laughs> that'd be weird, and it's before. How did I know? <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> it was called "I'm Really Different Now." See, all right. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Did you, is that the title that you had? Not and "I'm Really Different Now," but is that "Naked and Bloody"? Is that the only title you've ever had for this? For this show, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Tell us what the deal is with the show. Like what what led up to it, and and what because. You know, when you guys, you, you're doing a show, mm -hmm. when you're going to do something like that, yeah. there is some kind of a reason. Sure. There's something. <laughs> there you're not going to do There's Naked and Bloody it. unless you're Roman Polanski and you're on a jet. Whew. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I did a little bit like Rickles, so yeah. that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're on jet. Yeah. Uh, so so what is it and how did, uh, how did what was the process of you putting it together? Okay, well, uh, basically, Naked and Bloody refers to the condition I'm in at the beginning of the show in the time that I'm referring to, which is eight and a half years ago. I uh, drank and did drugs mm -hmm. uh, a lot, mm -hmm. and I uh, wanted to quit and had wanted to quit for a long time. 
And one night, I drank into a blackout, and I drove the car that I was in into, it wasn't mine, I drove it into the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power very fast, <laughs> and I, I got very badly hurt. No one else oh. was involved in the Sorry. accident. No, please laugh. Uh, no one else was involved in the accident, but I broke both my arms, and my legs were damaged, and I was in jail in a wheelchair, so I'm bloody, because uh, my was bleeding from it, and uh, the naked part of it comes from when they wheeled me around in jail, I would sometimes slide out of my wheelchair, <laughs> and I couldn't bend my arms. I couldn't stop myself <laughs> from sliding out because my arms didn't work, nor did my legs. So my hospital <laughs> gown would come up and expose <laughs> my naked body to everybody in jail. <laughs> and uh, so I was, uh, so I was, in fact, naked and bloody. And then basically from there, uh, jail. Then I went to rehab. Then I went to a sober living halfway house for men in West Los Angeles. This happened eight and a half years ago, and uh, I haven't drank since then, or done drugs since then, and uh, basically it's the story of the sort of crucible of the first few months after the accident of the surgeries and all the legal proceedings and all that stuff. Now, I waited eight and a half years to do this uh, and thought, you know what, I probably won't do this in a show. Uh, but then after a while, some of it started to kind of emerge in my stand-up. Once I had kind of gotten healthier, you know, mentally and physically, uh, and then I thought, you know what, why, why not tell this story with this much time between me and it having happened so that it can now be uh, funny because I don't want anyone to learn anything. I don't want anyone to feel anything. I don't want anything. I Because I, I always thought, who would do a one-person show? An asshole, you know, would do a one-person show. Yeah. I don't, I thought it's fundamentally not okay for someone to do that genuinely. And so, but then I thought, you know what, if I can just. It's fundamentally not okay for anyone to yeah. do anything genuinely at, at all. In my world. And, and they're yeah. an asshole. So they're doing all exactly. assholes. For doing it. So, but I thought, you know what, if I just tell these stories because like I told you just now you were laughing thank goodness having heard the horror of it and so if I just lay out the facts a lot of them are pretty funny and I think <laughs> it'll be funny if you see the person telling the story clearly healthy bright-eyed reasonably happy that the sort of juxtaposition would create the laughs so it is people laugh at the show as much as they laugh at my stand-up which as you both know is not Hardly at all. It's so, a good amount. Yeah, it's, it's a, a fair it's amount. It's healthy amount. There, there laughs occur. But, uh, so yeah, it's a funny show. The show is funny, and it's about horrible things that happen to me, and I just try to p tell the truth about them, you know, in an effort to make people laugh, and but not learn. That's very interesting. So you came up with this not, not learning thing. Yes. <clears throat> How did you stop yourself from writing? I mean, you had to write them in a very spare way. You write them very mm -hmm. straight on, and you perform it very straight on, as opposed to... And then I learned about God. <laughs> yeah, no, because that stuff happened, what you're referring to. I mean, I, you know, went, like, I, I go to therapy and all that, and I, I had to work through all the stuff that made me want to drink, you know, 32 beers in every 24-hour period, you know, for the years before that. So I don't, you know, I genuinely am a lot happier and healthier now, big time. And I'm glad that that accident happened, you know, because otherwise I wouldn't have quit and I would have died or I would have killed somebody. No, you know, no doubt about it. So, but I think that if you, like, quote unquote, turn the lights on and examine these <clears throat> things and are honest about them, then it can result in something good and funny, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but I just didn't want to be preachy. <clears throat> You know, I can't. It's I can't help it if somebody does walk away having learned a little bit, even though I didn't want them to. You know, I uh, like get a jumper if you're in the hospital and your arms are broken. Yeah, if that's all you learn kind of a, is that when you really go <laughs> on a bender, to gather it. Yeah. put on a diaper. You know, is right. it that? Just put on a diaper. You know, <laughs> then then I've done my job. My God. Now I, let me let me have, has mm -hmm. this? How has this? How did this? How did it color your stand up? All of this. How did it come stand up? I well, mean, it's funny because you mentioned about you know different road gigs and stuff. Like sometimes, if like if I go on after an opener or whatever, or it's people are talking about drinking and drugs, you know, I might mention you know that I uh, don't do that anymore, and here's why, and I'll tell an anecdote in a funny, you know, practiced way so that it is stand up level worthy funny, but. Uh, Oh, also because I the best stand up is honest stand up. So sure. you ha do have to talk about yourself if sure. you want to be enduringly <clears throat> funny, you know. So, uh, so I talk about who I am, and that's part of who I am is all that stuff that happened. Right. So yeah, that comes out. And what about and what about somebody's drunk in the club? 
and they're and they're the heckler and they're sitting there. They're obviously slow. I mean, how do you handle that? If somebody's that now? drunk and they heckle me, uh, you know, since I have developed sympathy uh, for people like that, I'll put that sympathy on the shelf and then I'll take out a verbal sword and I'll eviscerate them. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'll teach them a lesson involving a great deal of pain and teach themselves that even though they might be hungover and in a blackout, they'll remember what I said, because I really want to hurt, no. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll just have that bad feeling. Yeah, they'll be like, like what they happened? They don't know what the Something words were. Something bad happened Ooh, yeah. to me, yeah. what was it? It no. was bad. Um, but will you, will, you, will you connect with that? Will you? No, no, because like the thing is, I don't drink anymore, but I don't care if other people drink. I mean, I want people to be happy, even strangers, and you know, part of me feels like bad for somebody who's making an embarrassment of themselves, you know, but that's not the place for me to Teach them right. a lesson, you right. know. So I'll just, I'll just, and a drunk heckler is is in some ways easier to deal with than like a sober heckler, you know, because their synapses aren't firing as fast. So you can give them enough rope, and they will hang themselves, you know. And then physically, I'll literally hang their their corpse from a, a <laughs> branch. After You'll the have show. to do that as a favor to them. Well, sure. sure. I had a, a really drunk woman at the end of a, a show. Um, again at the San Francisco Punchline, but this, I had gone back. I was no longer a showcaser, I was a middler. And I was standing by the front door, as comics love to do, when the show was over and they pretend that they just happened to be there so that people could tell them they did a great job. And uh, so I was standing there and this super drunk woman was kind of being almost carried out by her husband or by some man. She, she was like leaning on him and like her eyes were closed. And then she passed me and she looked up and she opened her eyes and she goes, oh. You made me so sad. <laughs> yeah. And then I That's knew. Good that, that you get happened. those things with people leave you with a little thing on their way out. Yeah. You because have... you know why? Because I put a lot on them. Mm -hmm. So they. That's <laughs> they exactly what I did treat. do to her. I did that to her, uh, and I, I deserve to be told that by right. the drunkest woman on the face of the earth. <clears throat> made me sad. Made me sad. You made me so sad. Mm -hmm. I had. Uh, I had. Rick Reynolds used to do a show. Uh, a solo show, and then I started. Now I wanted to do a solo show so badly. But again, this is a long time ago. I came down here. I tried to convince two guys who were backers. This happened to me twice to do the show to put up money for the show, and I developed chickenpox pneumonia <laughs> as a result twice. of it. As a result of it, because I had worked myself up into such a frenzy. I got to get down to L.A. and do that solo show, man. <laughs> I was like a bad like. It was like rebel that didn't know about causes, wow. but I was like, we're, you know, I got to do that show, man. And and these guys, and so I'm trying to convince them, and they did. And then once I got down here, I didn't know what the show was. And the LA Weekly came out. I mean, this is this is what you do, you know. It was like a ridiculous thing. There was there was like a bed in the show for no reason. <laughs> yeah. I had nothing that related to a bed, but there was a bed there. Uh, I was dressed like Betty Davis for no reason. Oh, yeah. um, that's a strong choice. Not the good that. Betty Davis. Betty Davis from the Whales of August. Oh, God. Oh. Bless you. Um, looking more like Skeletor than Betty Davis. More eyelids than anything else. <laughs> more total. A lot of this. A lot of <laughs> none of that. <laughs> so, so this was, yeah, I mean, it was crazy. So we all, and then another time was uh, there was a big backers thing. This is the, the point of this whole thing is if you really w think that you want want something, uh, let it go. Uh, <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Don't want these things, but just do your work and then everything will happen in time. But no, I get um, it. Greenwichville, there was a theater and there was a big night and it was like a backer's night and it was a solo show and I'd been doing this for years and in that audience was everybody who had money in the world was in that audience. Herb Alpert was in the audience. Oh. I mean, big Broadway like producers. Dina Merrill was in the audience. Oh. Uh, Woody Allen's sister was in the like for his production company. It was like crazy. Anne Marie. Anne Marie from <laughs> from from Snowbird was in the audience. Uh, Slim Whitman was there. No, I don't know. So they were all they were all there, and it was the one night where the air conditioning went out, Ugh. and it was summertime, and it was like you know 89 90, to 95 degrees. And Marsha Brickman, who co-wrote Annie Hall, was in that audience. Uh -huh. And I, I did a pretty good show, but I looked out halfway through, and, and Marsha Brickman's head was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> there was just like a volcano of fire, and everybody was like desperately striving to stay awake. They were trying so hard to stay awake. But you know, in, in the heat, uh, an hour and a half show, not yeah. gonna happen. That's, so. wait, wait, you opened for me that night that there was no air, it was the first night. There was no air anything. conditioning. Yeah. And, it was, 
It was well. First of all, it's like it's it was the heat wave two years ago, mm -hmm. so that it was it was probably like a hundred degrees <laughs> in this room, <laughs> and um, of course you have all the people that have folded things up. It's not like we, I, I didn't have like a flyers or anything, but they had found things to fold and wave in front of them. <laughs> people are just sweating overtly. And of course, because I didn't have, I wasn't really planned and I wasn't really, I knew I was gonna sing these songs, but in between, I was just gonna see what happens. And so of course it went on forever. It was like I couldn't stop. I couldn't get the laugh and I couldn't stop, you know, get the big final thing before the last song. And people were like passing out and hallucinating, and everyone looked like Whitney Houston. It was it was the <laughs> worst. Was we were. I remember my father had to take him by Cedar Sinai, which is just around the corner after the show, and get him. He yeah. just that gave him an IV and <laughs> rehydrated. Yeah, him. gave him a rehydration <laughs> pack. Mm -hmm. But he still loved the show. You say he did love the show. That's what's yeah. important. That's what's important. He was just temporarily sidelined. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it was. Uh, now I let me remind you that you're watching this week in comedy. Ed Krasnick. Karen Kilgariff, Rob Delaney. Rob talking about a one-man show. Karen, I'm hoping. Now I don't know if we can do this. We're gonna take a. We're gonna take a look. Uh, we're gonna do a clip here, and when we come back, I'm hoping that maybe you'll play a song for us. I'll think about it. All right, we'll take a look uh, from a clip of uh, Last Comic Standing. Let's take a look at the, a couple of the people who performed because there were some very funny comics. I thought. Um, here is. Uh, should we do uh, Mike Kaplan? Is Mike mm. there? He's great. Kenny, if we've got Mike. Please welcome Mike Kaplan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Let's have another round of applause when I'm done. <laughs> you guys seem smart, which is great, because you're not encouraged to be smart these days. Growing up in school, there are bullies who are like, I'll knock the books out of your hands. Now neither of us can read. <laughs> You don't have to read because every book's made into a movie. Just go see a movie. You don't have to read a book. But book people are getting smart. They're called authors. Book people, they'll re-release a book when the movie comes out. They'll put a picture of the actor on the cover, trick people who like movies into buying books. <laughs> Example, Fight Club was a movie made out of a book. They re-release it. People are like, oh, Brad Pitt's in this book. <laughs> so far, just words. <laughs> Some people are reading, but they're getting into religious fiction, you know, reading things like The Da Vinci Code or the Bible. And I know, yeah, <laughs> sure, The Da Vinci Code might be real, okay? But whatever your religion is, that's great. Just don't get so religiously extreme you start denying reality. There, there's people who are like, gay doesn't exist. You don't see gay in the natural world. And you know what I don't see as much in the natural world? Angels. <laughs> Those are half human, half bird creatures. The devil's half man, half goat. I've seen gays more, is all I'm saying. <laughs> like, there's some people who think that the devil is the ultimate evil and that gay people are the ultimate evil, but they don't think the devil is gay. Why not? I mean, he's horny and flaming close enough, so. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Well, that was Mike Kaplan from uh, Boston, I think, yeah, where there's there. a lot of great comics, not uh, talking about myself, but there were some some great comments, including Rob Delaney. All from right, Boston? yeah, like Rob that. is from Marblehead, right? Correct. Great place. Mm -hmm. Great place. Great place to sail. Great place to have humor. Oh, hum are you, you're rich? No, in fact, mm. uh, a lot of people from Marblehead are, but uh, the Delaney's. Uh, I don't really want to talk about it. Okay. No. <laughs> 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 well, we're middle class, you know. We're going to talk about so we're going to talk about singing because you also okay. sing. I, and, I do. And have done singing in, in a lot mm -hmm. of large public venues. But now a lady who uh, really brings it in mm -hmm. and brings it home <laughs> and is able to take it home and bring it home. Um, Karen Kilgariff, everybody, is going to sing a song for us. Um, might be out of tune. My thing is that I don't, the, the tuning of the guitar does not impact me in any way. It's almost like a prop. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, this is not the song that you were talking about earlier. This is a newer, this is a newer release. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus walks and he runs and he flies. He 
can harness the wind. He's in charge of who lives and dies. He has open wounds and his heart's on fire. He can see us right now. He is watching us. Oh my God. Oh my God. He's behind you. <laughs> Jesus lived then he had to die because of your sins. Because of how much you lie, he forgives you now. You'll see him soon. And then when you do, he will smash you. Jesus song, everybody. Oh, Karen Kilgariff, everybody. <laughs> That's it. Wow. <laughs> Jesus will smash you. It's really weird to sing a song that close to another person. I didn't know what I should do other yeah. than and drink it in and enjoy it. I could hear your mouth sounds. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I drank the biggest coffee in the world before we came in here, mm -hmm. and I'm not drinking water now so that I don't oh, no, yeah. pee myself. That. You have to drink water. Are uh, you trying not to drink water? Well, I don't know if I may. Okay, sure, I'll have a little I mean, drink. Thank you so sip. much. I don't want there to be sip. mouth noises. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of the instrumentation. Yes, exactly. It was like click, click, oh, click, click. Oh, Jesus, I love, I love that song. Tell us the the inspiration for that song, because did you grow up, uh, were you, were you, church going? Holy Roman Catholic, yes. Holy shit. I went to Catholic school. Holy cow. I did the whole, I did the whole, the whole run. Are you a papal person? No. <laughs> All right. No. Thank, please. No, I like Don't it. write well, in. I, I like how we've got Kilgariff and Delaney. We're both in blue and we both grew, I went to Catholic school as well. Did you? Yeah, terrible. Yeah, not good. You shouldn't. Well, talk about drinking. I mean, I, that's, I mean, I grew up believing there was yeah. absolutely nothing wrong with 30, 32 mm -hmm. beers a day. That was like, we had a nun that, I mean, yeah, yeah it was, that was standard fare. That was mm -hmm. just how you got through. I mean, you're going to burn in hell. Oh, yeah. You have to drink some beers. Yeah, you have to bring along some, some fun. Yeah, uh, what, have before it you now, burn. now, you know, before the burning. We, as a kid, when you, were, when you were in Catholic school, I mean, were you, did you think it was completely absurd the whole time and you were like, I'm just biding my time till I get out of here? Or were you like, wow, this is really, I have to really. No, I bought it. I was like. I remember one time staring, staring at the front of the church, just like begging in my mind, begging like, let him show up right now. Like I completely remember this really intense. <clears throat> it was kind of that thing of like, Jesus is coming back, and we'll just see where you know when and where he shows up. And if you're good enough, you know maybe you'll be there. Maybe if you don't gossip or you know think Masturbate. dirty thoughts exactly maybe he'll show up to you it was that that kind of idea of like it was like a special guest star that you might get so i remember sitting there one time of like let's do this thing let's get him here <laughs> by popular demand yes or, I, I or at least to see my, the strength of my prayer might make a statue cry tears of blood <laughs> and you totally believe that as a catholic kid you're like if i pray hard enough i can make a statue cry blood yeah not joking and then we can all go to it all yeah. day oh, long totally. and all night my grandmother will be so happy if yeah. i make a statue cry blood i can do it <laughs> I, I actually, that's a good goal my uh, aunt is a nun and i adore her and she's a, a wonderful person an amazing person and she was down visiting she lives up in San Francisco and she was down visiting once um, and they went to the uh, the big church downtown that that's the architectural wonder that I've mm -hmm. never I don't even know the name of it I've never been there I'm uh, obviously a lapsed Catholic but they went there and she was telling me about these amazing sculptures they have um, on either side and in the Catholic Church we they're the stations of the cross where you it's pictures and usually relief mm -hmm. sculptures of Jesus and how he really had the worst day ever and you just can see it from all angles of the church well in this new church it's all the saints of the future is what this amazing artist has sculpted I think it's Angelica Houston's husband oh he sculpted, Robert Graham yeah, yeah so it's all the saints of the future and she was telling me about it and then <clears> she goes 
<laughs> you might be I one of them. Like, I don't think. I don't My think so. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, when I was eight, that could have happened. But these, no, not with the things I've been through. Oh my God! I don't That's think I'm going to so be a saint of the future. A saint of the future, and that again, though, something to aspire to, something to look forward to. Maybe my eyeballs will be on a plate one day. <laughs> something to look. Forward to. I could be John the Baptist. I could be on a silver tray. My entire head. Aspire. I have a quick sad story that I just thought of. My, I live in Santa Monica, and my wife and I went to Muscle Beach recently to watch a, uh, a bodybuilding contest. <laughs> and uh, and this this was last summer. You could stop it, it there. It would have been last summer. And, sad uh, enough. Yeah. And Angelica Houston was there with her husband, and uh, and then and we saw them. And for some reason, they had Angelica Houston like introduce the bodybuilders in the beginning because she was like friends. <laughs> with one of the organizers. This so did little, not was, happen. No, it really did. And it was a little odd, you know, but it was fun <laughs> to see Angelica Houston. I mean, who doesn't love Angelica Houston? God. And then the bodybuilding contest was bananas. <laughs> but uh, then not long after, her husband passed away, Aww. and uh, which was sad because, you know, we had seen them. And then just the other day, we saw, my wife and I, we saw Angelica Houston the other day come out of a restaurant alone and get into her car by herself, and we thought, you know, that's oh. sad because we had developed such a relationship with them. <laughs> and then what you didn't see is the driver was one of those huge guys that couldn't even put his arms yeah, down. Get in here. And they both killed her husband. <laughs> now that's horrible. And the seasons, <laughs> they go around and round. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> that, that is uh, an unusual, but that's what you get in L.A. You get this unusual. Yeah, things like that happen. You get the Magic. unusual connection. Mm -hmm. I got, the thing I had was... Uh, uh, little Richard buying Girl Scout cookies in front of Aunt Kizzy's back porch soul food oh, restaurant. Mm. Love that and restaurant. And he walked up to oh, this great place. And he walked, he got out of a limousine and he had a, like a purple zoot suit on. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. of course. And he went up to, the, and the little girls were selling cookies in a, a tray, mm -hmm. a stack table and the trays. And he goes up and he says, I love these cookies. And the little <gasps> girls, their heads went up like a racer head. It was just like, woo. And they were scared to death. But what, I have to tell you, that exact <clears throat> same thing happened to me when we worked on, Karen Anderson and I worked on Hollywood Squares. When, uh. Uh, Ellen was on Hollywood Squares before the talk show. <clears throat> and uh, so we were working on there, and one day we went to go up to get lunch. And of course, he was in one of, uh, Little Richard was in one of the squares. And I was in the elevator. I got my lunch and went back down to, to go. And uh, when the elevator doors opened, he was standing with his back to the elevator being filmed. There's, you know, it was like almost like that crazy Hollywood thing where it was like there was a big light and there was a cameraman and whatever, and he's talking to somebody, <clears throat> and then he spins around to the elevator, and I'm just kind of stuck in it, and then he looks at my lunch plate and goes, watermelon, who? <laughs> and I was like, I did not know what to do. It was the, one of the more uncomfortable experiences of my life. Oh. But I thought it was special. Now I realize he just makes that noise to every object that he approaches everywhere it's, he goes. Uh, it's an object thing. <laughs> it's not people. He doesn't say it to you. Well, at least it's food related. Thing. It's food related, it's food yeah. Related. It's, yeah. He likes sweets. Mm -hmm. He's a genius. The guy who's a genius, he's a reverend. He probably will be a future saint. He'll be mm -hmm. a future saint In for some sure. way. Yeah. Uh, the Station of the Cross, you know, my best friend is Irish Catholic mm -hmm. and a Bostonian, and he used to take me to church with him. And my mother told me one thing. She says, if they start to kneel, <laughs> You're not going down. <laughs> this is what my mother said to me. If they start to, I don't care what happens, all right? But if they start to kneel, mm -hmm. you're not going down. Love it. So I have this in my head. And now they're doing the kneel. Now they're going down on the, they're doing the kneeling. So I didn't kneel. And a nun comes over and grabs me by the ear. Mm -hmm. They did and that. And pulled me out of the, the ear boxing. And it was, it was during Stations of the Cross, which I actually thought was, I thought it was great because I like transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that you can go from station to station. Mm -hmm. I wondered if there was a transfer. Yeah. I wondered what you paid in those days. Could there be a Charlie in the MBA <laughs> scenario where you're stuck between? You're he never returned. Yeah. In this case, he did. That was just for us, that joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. right. That is yeah. very Bostonian. Mm -hmm. That's pretty funny. Wow. No, but, but now your aunt is a nun. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of conversations? He's like, does she know, like, would she, ever, would she come to see you perform? She's me. Oh yeah, my family is like the second I'm anywhere. There's 25 Kilgariffs. They've taken up three tables and they're running the show. Like they, 
they're insanely supportive. And she actually came once when I was middling for Margaret Cho. Oh, God. And I was so nervous. I used to get so nervous <clears throat> beforehand and so, like, stressed out. And I went into the bathroom, and she was in there. And I was like, Aunt Mary. And I was, like, grabbing her. I'm like, you can't be mad at me for the things that she's going to say. And she's like, I'm an adult. I Believe me, I've heard it. And I said, I'm going to say, I'm probably going to swear. I can't help it. And she's like, we know you swear. And I said, and I can't. You have to believe me. Like, you're not going to believe what Margaret Cho was about to say. She's like, Karen, I'm adult, and I thank you, but believe me. And then I looked at my family during her set, which of course was just like, it started with the fisting, and from there it was like through the roof. And I looked over at my family, they were just like, they were like pallid and drawn, and they, they had no idea what, what was happening to them. Yeah. Why? Why? Simply why? What the? Yeah. Oh, that's very. It funny. was incredible. That's yeah. very. Funny. And did did they meet Margaret after the show? No, I never saw them after that. <laughs> <laughs> the last I saw all of them was 1997. I went to the church and there <laughs> they were relief statues yeah. in there. They were, that's one of my favorite things that Woody Allen does in Radio Days. He has this thing where the lady is looking out the window and she sees a, a, an African American and a white girl and they're kissing. He's got a guitar over his shoulder and they the woman not only does she freeze. <clears throat> but she develops rigor mortis. <laughs> and she continues to hold the saucer and the cup to her lips like this. And the police come and they take her out sideways. Oh. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. They're like, <laughs> and she just stopped. That's so great. Love that. So, you were, you also, as I mentioned, you, you. You had, also hate interracial couples. <laughs> that, that's correct. Are from Boston. Of course yeah. you do. Yeah. You're from Boston. Right. It's the worst. Um, you, you, you sing and you have sung in, uh, with the singing nun. Mm -hmm. uh, you've sung in, in, in very major places, huge audiences. Are you, uh, you're talking about national anthems? I'm talking about national anthems. Sing okay. it now. Sing it now. Can nice. you sing do it now on the table. The Israeli national, no. Um, <laughs> I do not recognize uh, Israel's existence. Oh. So I won't sing it. Good to know now. Good to know now. The Palestinian's <laughs> Choice, Rob Delaney. Go and see his show, <laughs> Naked and Bloody, on the Gaza Strip. <laughs> Along um. with the other people. Um, what? Uh, so t tell us about uh, about how you came to sing. I mean, this is weird. The national yeah, anthem it is, is weird. Okay. Well, first of all, it came. Uh, well, grew up in Boston, of course, and I had a friend who worked for the Red Sox. Yeah. So she knew because we had been in musicals in high school together that I sang. So she said, for fun, record yourself singing the national anthem and give it to me. And so I did, and. They then asked me if I would come sing the national anthem for the Red Sox at Fenway Park, and uh, this you, it is a wonderful honor to do that. But there are there's 162 games a year in a major league, so they can't get Josh Groban for each game <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> and then the, sometimes they have to get people like me. Sadly, for you know out of all those games, you can't get great people. So. I sang it, uh, and I've ne since then I've done Fenway uh, numerous times, and I've also done the Dodgers, uh, and it never is anything, anything other than wonderful. It's a, uh, it's so great because I love baseball, and uh, the first actually the first year that I did it was 2004 when the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in 86 years. So, mm. I mean it was just bananas, <laughs> and uh, singing at Fenway Park, which is by any yardstick you could use. I mean, it's the best park in the world for baseball, so it was just... But take us through the program. Uh, now, you come, you show up there. Yeah. A limp car get you? Uh, no, I got myself there. You get uh, yourself there. They do give you, they <clears throat> give you four amazing tickets, like, worth more than anyone would ever be paid to do. Sitting behind yeah. the plate, yeah. you're right there, first row. Yeah. <clears throat> now, now what, so what do they do? The guy, a guy comes, they handle you, there's a PR guy for the Red Sox yeah, or something, they much. take you in. They walk they down, say, they Do they say anything to you? Like, it's a big crowd tonight, it should be, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, they, do that. they don't <laughs> have oh, to say much. Oh, it's fucking bizarre, yeah. Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> Come no, on. They're very, uh, cordial and kind and, and they say you know do a respectful non-adorned version of the song in about 90 seconds which means not black <clears throat> yeah don't do it blackly <laughs> it doesn't blackly sing it um, and uh, <laughs> so but yeah then you just sing it and you know well you don't just sing it I, the first time that I did it I almost blacked out and I've performed in various circumstances and <laughs> in, in all kinds of things but this was the most nervous I've ever been to the point that I actually had to like use like 
philosophy to get through. Like, <laughs> like, before, before I started singing, I was like, well, there's going to be a game here. Before each game, since baseball started, they've sung the national anthem. Someone needs to sing it tonight. It happens to be you. So just do that thing that needs to happen. <laughs> not, not like I'm going to sing the anthem. But like a person needs to do a thing. You, it so happens that you're that person. Don't worry about that. But this thing needs to happen. So I was just like, okay. I had to fully like detach myself. It was like reaching in to work on a preemie baby with the gloves through the thing. Like, it's not me. I have nothing. I, I don't know. think it's like and, that uh, at all. And it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> Somebody's coming through me. But yeah, you know what I mean? It's not you, obviously. Yeah. No. It works through you. And so I don't really remember it until sort of the end. And I was like, okay, I'm almost done. I'm going to permit myself to enjoy maybe the last three notes. <clears throat> And then as soon as I was like, and the home of the brave, like I went brave, I did that. And I thought, oh my God, everybody heard that. But apparently enough people do that that they know to turn the mic off right away. So I went like brave and they're like off so that I could go like. You mean there's just excess air just, that comes uh, out? Like, like it happened. You did. The, you delivered the yeah, song. The person that needed to do the thing did it. So now oh, you can eat five hot dogs. You stepped back in. Yeah, that like became me again. <laughs> but then, obviously, But then you've done this a number of times. You do it. Now, you've done a Dodger Stadium it's a different yeah. kind of experience. Very different. Oh, because first of all, in in LA, they have like a Hollywood level PA system, which literally like auto corrects so that you hear yourself like a, a half a second late, so you don't have to deal with the echo. It's kind of magic. They also have an accompanist. They don't even have that at Fenway. You're just they're like go, but they're like you can do it in the key of your choice with the wonderful Dodgers organist whose name is Nancy B. My wow. I prefer to sing it in A flat, and then she plays along. So singing it. Oh, and the words are in front of you at Fenway. You have to know. Know the words. Yeah, what? you have to know the words. You have to know the words. This knows is you. America. Over Dodgers there. is pretty much is, is rather easy compared to Fenway, uh, but they're both great and and very fun to do. Now, uh, do either of you regularly? Because I, I, it's hard to watch regular TV, like, and mm -hmm. to be devoted to a series. Mm -hmm. Do you have a series that you're devoted? Do you watch anything? <clears throat> Every week, this is what you watch. Um, I watch Law and Order in a way that has become problematic in my life. Yeah, because you're going to miss other things. I would say, well, yeah, or <clears throat> I'd prefer to do that than other things. Okay. Um, use it as an avoidance technique. And it's been an excuse to not do shows. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of problems. But uh, it actually came out of, it reminds me of, it was like that same tour um, of doing colleges, being on the road around the time of Moscow, Idaho, where I would just, I would always eat it horribly and uh, have some experience that of course, it, I always needed to kill righteously and destroy and then leave where it's like, but you're in a, a college cafeteria with 12 kids. Like no one, no one would destroy in here. Why not just enjoy yourself? But uh, what, I, and <laughs> sorry, sidetrack. Yeah. So I would go back to my, hotel room and no matter what time of day or night law and order would be on oh, always so. and so it, be, it started <clears throat> to become this intensely comforting thing that I never really paid attention to before but suddenly I would be like I'd snap it on I'd be like my friends and then it would, <laughs> I'd really take a lot of comfort in like I'm safe again I'm home you, you know, know I, I gotta tell you there, there's like for a comedian the best thing there's two good really good things to do after a show I think mm -hmm. one is go out to a restaurant with other comedians, go out with mm -hmm. a friend, Very friends, fun. and tell stories. Yep. <clears throat> That's really great. Mm -hmm. Two is to go immediately into a movie theater. Mm. Immediately <laughs> into a movie theater. And it doesn't matter how good the movie is, it doesn't matter what the movie is. Because you're just going there to masturbate. You go in there to, <laughs> thank you. Immediately go into masturbate. No, um, no but, uh, but I, I'm serious. I was at the Miami, to, uh, at the uh, Miami Improv, this is like a while, Miami Improv, Coconut Grove, and the movie Bad Lieutenant. Mm. Mm. And you're thinking, well, that's not really a good place to go after you've been uh, sure. in a live experience to be in a dead one. Mm -hmm. But no, because you go into a theater, it gives you permission to relax. Mm -hmm. You can come down from whatever you experienced in the club. Slip your pants off. You can take your pants <laughs> off, have a nice rest, which is a euphemism for masturbating. <laughs> take a nice bath <laughs> yep. uh, in your own juices. Uh, no, I don't know. Yep. No, but I mean, it really, it really is. It's a great thing. Do you have a movie that comforts you? Is there a movie? Now, usually the best movies to comfort you sometimes are bad ones that are mm -hmm. familiar to you. Do you. Are there any films that you have that you'd watch to sort of like, you're in trouble, 
you need to calm down, you need to be taken care of. Is there a movie? Yeah, I, for, I, it's funny that you said that. I immediately thought of the movie The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Oh. Have you guys seen that movie? <laughs> I, I have great. not. Oh, it's God. Amazing. You have to see it. It's Catherine Deneuve. It's, a, it's a Jacques right. Demy made it. It's 63, maybe. Jesus. And it's a French. Technically, it's an opera because it's fully sung through. And it is so beautiful and just. Uh, it's it's amazing, wow. and I watched that. It came on TV, I remember, a few months ago, and I was like, I'll just watch a tiny minute of it, and then I, I'm, it's all flash forward at the end, and I'm sobbing. Comforted. Such a masterpiece. Oh, my God, is it beautiful. What do you like, and what, what grabs you about it most? Uh, the color is beautiful. Jacques and me, the director, visually, uh, it's it's a very beautiful-looking movie. Yeah. And then Catherine Deneuve, I, just, I like to just stare at static images of her anyway, so amazing. in motion, even better. And then the music is wonderful. Michelle Legrand. Michel, oh, sure. Michel Legrand Michel is the Legrand. music. Michel Legrand. Big Michael. Big Mike. Big Mike. <laughs> it really uh, does. I think hey, Big Mike of, is coming yeah. in. It's Big Mike. And so that movie like all it like celebrates life big time, but it's also incredibly sad. And then it's also about like the adaptability of how you can get thrown a curveball uh, and 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 adapt in a good way. So uh, uh, that movie makes me feel good. Um, yeah. Interesting. I've never heard. I've ne that's one that I've never. Heard You'll before. freak out. You personally are you're gonna freak well, out. I'm gonna get it. Yeah, I'm, gonna, good. I'm gonna get it. And you, hey Vu? Um, the first one that comes to mind is Michael Clayton. I just think it's a perfect <gasps> you film. Did. Yes. You said it's, Michael Clayton. It, yeah. It's the kind of movie where no matter where it is, I have a really odd uh, wa television <clears throat> watching style. A lot of things bug me easily. Um, and most of the time I I can't rewatch movies unless I really, really love it. I can't watch it again. It's like I sit there anticipating, and I oh, it's this part and whatever, and I dismiss it, and um, it's it's problematic for me. I've watched Michael Clayton like 50 times. I just think it's a perfect, it's a perfectly made film, mm -hmm. perfectly written, perfectly acted, and every like I just think it's so it's, it's so incredible, and it's incredible. I mean, I know it got nominated for things, but it like. I remember seeing it like months after it came out in like a little theater down on Wilshire or something going like I guess I'll see that serious one mm. and like just being in there so blown away of like this is a perfect movie it's an action movie it's like I don't know great I just characters. think it's amazing great character totally. <clears throat> Tom Wilkinson right Tom oh Wilkinson. Tom Wilkinson in that movie well in every movie is very good but, but he does he he is it extremely amazing in this movie extremely he almost provides an overture in the beginning mm -hmm. with that monologue. Oh my god. Yeah, Forget the way they it. and it's so um, my mother is a psychiatric nurse, so I love to think that I know mm -hmm. what real like uh, mm -hmm. bipolar or schizophrenia or whatever would be as a po you know, I think I'm yeah. an expert. Mm -hmm. Um and I just you can't uh, you can't scratch that like especially that opening monologue, the ranting and the kind of like the the kind of thought processes and the way he talks and the desperation and hmm. it's just amazing. And then Michael, um, and then Michael George. Clayton himself. <laughs> George, um, George. I call him Michael Clayton. Who is Michael? He's he's so <clears throat> perfectly toned and perfectly he's under pressure, but it's not a lot of mm -hmm. brow wiping and look at me. It's just all just like he's trying to bite his lip through the whole thing, and it's just. Per and then of course Tilda Swinton. As in her character at the very end, she goes, "You don't want the money," and it's like all the energy. It's this is not uh, Michael Clayton this week. I want to get sorry. On her. I gotta go home and see Michael. Clayton. I gotta tell no, I, gotta, I really do. I gotta. You know what? We should see a Michael Clayton. These were the, they used to have the theaters that would do you know double features like the New Beverly. There were many theaters like that in Boston. Mm -hmm. I skipped school almost every day. <laughs> and, I'm not kidding. I went to. Cinema 766, which is on Boylston Street, which was run by the mob, which had two feet, two mo new movies every day changed, and you'd see Catch-22 and Harold and Maude. Uh. Every day. And then the next day would be like Bonnie and Clyde and The Great Escape. That was every day. So that's what I did. That's what I did. I never, I don't have any education. I don't have any formal education, but I can tell you about Arthur Penn's shoe size. Well, <laughs> it's clear that you didn't go through the American educational system yeah. or any educational system. None. You do, there is sort of a, there's a story based sort of, you have a I have reference that I can be like, I know, I saw that's that. That's exactly what I it is. I saw that cartoon. <laughs> that, I can jump in. That, and I say, I say the cartoon, yes, and I know uh, enough about it. That I can say, and I actually know that through, mm -hmm. by, and I know chemistry, mm -hmm. I can do that way. Mm -hmm. This is actually a true story. I went 
uh, to school one day, and I had been out so long that they removed my desk. <laughs> so you had desk, desk, no desk, and then desk. Wow. And it was a chemistry class. An and I walked in, and everybody started laughing. An edge-shaped hole. That was it. There was just a desk. No, uh, sh- nothing. Nothing there. Um, what movie comforts you? There are so many, but if I'm really in trouble, it's really Godfather 2. Mm. Mm. It's not The Godfather. It's 2. Because of the incredible storytelling jumping back and forth in time without uh, perfect symmetry. I don't know how they made it. I don't know how they did it. Every shot is a movie in itself. Every single shot. If you want to tell a story about the immigrant experience in America, all you have to do is show the shot of the boat coming into, into the harbor. That's a movie. Then you go to the little boy sitting in the, in the, in the locked off place in Ellis Island and that's a movie. And then you go to the dinner scene, which is really a flashback, and then that's a movie. And then you go, I mean, these are, these are great moments in film. But oddly enough, for like just like comfort food, a we- for the longest time, it was a movie Once Around. I love that movie. <laughs> that's what it was. That's a good movie. So I've got The Godfather and Once Around. Lassie Halstrom directs it. Oh. And of course, My Life as a Dog mm-hmm. is a genius film. But that film is not, it's not the like Richard a... Richard Dreyfuss movie? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not yeah, a major yeah, yeah. film. But there's something about that idea of family. And, and, and what's his name? The guy who... Danny uh, Aiello. Danny father. Aiello as the father and Jenna Rollins as the mother. And then the kids are Holly Hunter yeah. and... Robert Downey Jr. And, Robert, and Laura San Giacomo. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Those are the kids in the house. In one Master- family? <laughs> it's crazy. So much talent. Masterpiece. No, I love that movie. I really do. And oh. they've got that, you know, they're trying to do the Boston accent, which I yeah. always love. You know? <laughs> and she tries to pull it off, mother. Bless them. That's yeah, no. hard. No, it's good. It's I good. just rewatched Crossing Delancey last night. And that's a good, I uh, love that. I love that movie. Wow. It's a bit, I used to really love it. And watching it now, I know, mm. I know it's a bit ham-handed in the romance department. But that Peter Rieger. Peter Rieger's great. Is just like. Oh, he's so he's so sexy in that part, and so it's so real. But he's like, you think you know me? I think it defines when he's yelling at her in front of the elevator. Oh. So, what's her name? Uh, 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 Amy, Amy Irving. Irving, and the grandmother, who I loved uh, too, was very good in that. I and don't Sylvia know. Miles as the uh, as the the matchmaker. Oh. Sylvia Miles. You look, you try. <laughs> oh, she's so awesome, eating chicken and she's great. Yeah. Sam the pickle man mm-hmm. rubbed his hands in vanilla. See, you don't get this stuff on every comedy show. This is this one. <laughs> private conversations about They're movies. private <laughs> conversations. And I'll do that, and then I'll do this. Um, but here, here's the thing that I want to do. We go from that, we're going to go to a show that a lot of people are devoted to now, which is Mad Men. Um, and, I, and I do watch Mad Men. But I've never really seen it this way until I saw your interpretation of Mad Men. Now, I'm going to warn people, what you're about to see is absolutely filthy. So if you have any sensitivity to language or anything like that, uh, hide your children. Uh, But this is a parody of Mad Men from a Massachusetts perspective. Let's take a look at the, which do you think we should do, Rob? The first one or the second one? I would recommend the first one. Let's do the first one. This is Rob Delaney in a parody of Mad Men. Take a look. Fenway Park. (gasps) You're shitting me. Why would I lie about something like that, you fucking animals? Teddy Williams! Teddy Williams. Don, why wasn't I called in to discuss the Fenway Park account? Campbell Soup! Rubber! Oh, seriously, you know how much I care about the sauce? Uh, Teddy, Teddy Williams. Williams! Teddy Williams! You're off this one, Campbell. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm talking about the time that Joe Torre came in here to talk about his ball cancer PSA, and you told him that he and Johnny Damon should suck each other's cocks until they gave each other ball cancer in each other's fucking esophaguses. I was fucking hammered! Don't you fucking faggots know not to get fucking wasted before 2 o'clock? My girls can't be cleaning up puke all afternoon. Johnny, you fucking skank. Show me your tits. You're a married piece of shit, Roger. Your mother and your sister didn't care. Oh, you know what, Roger? Excuse me. You know what? I can see your tits through your shirt. Yeah, well, I can see you dick through your shirt, Roger, okay? You're an asshole. I know. All right, that's our fate. Did you want something, yeah. Joni? Piggy's outside your office. Who the fuck is Piggy? Who the fuck is Piggy? Piggy, Piggy, Who? Piggy Massey, Patty, whatever. Peggy? Peggy? Oh, whatever. She's a copywriter. Have some respect. Oh, she's a fucking slut, Pete, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, one time. Hey, Shut hey. your mouth. Stop fucking yelling. One time. Tell her to come in. I'd like to date rape that ass. Yeah, that wasn't attached to that mouth. Enough. She's a lady. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, I, 
<laughs> I heard about Fenway Park, John. I got some ideas. Oh, great. Love to hear them. Jesus, kiss ass much? Yeah, Tony, I haven't had a chance to come up with ideas myself. Are we going to party? Guys, let her talk. I was thinking about baseball. About how there's fans and peanuts. Oh, for Christ's sake. Let's oh, fucking wrap this relax, up. Relax, Campbell Soup. Yeah, don't be so hot on it. It's one fucking time, Roger. Peggy, continue. And I was thinking about how fathers take sons to games and what a bonding experience. That's uh, Rob Delaney in a Massachusetts That's perspective funny. of Mad Men. That is insanely funny. Uh, you know, we have to say uh, goodbye because, um, I don't know Because why. of that clip? <laughs> yes, we're done. <laughs> the show is done. We've done nine episodes. This is it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Thank you, Boston. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, it's so great to see you. Karen? Ed? Rob? Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure. And Tuesday night, where can they see the show? Uh, Comedy Central Stage. Comedy Central Stage, Tuesday night. If you're in town here in L.A., go see Rob Delaney in Naked and Bloody. You will not want to miss it. <laughs> uh, I'm Ed Krasick. Thanks for watching. Thanks to everybody here for all their help. Uh, next week, you're going to see uh, Jay Kogan, who did uh, Frasier and The Simpsons and many other shows, and Arnie Kogan, who wrote for Carol Burnett and Newhart, father and son team. Uh, you're not going to believe it. So next week, uh, come back. And keep coming back. It works if you work it. Good night.